Brendan Wuffler, who runs HPC cloud capabilities, etc., for Amazon Web Services. Uh, thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, so I come from the online book and decorative pillow company, um, uh, but I look after the research computing group in the in, inside Amazon. Um, so it's our task to make sure that the cloud remains uh, forever useful to folks like you guys um, who are trying to use it for, you know, wanting to use it for science. And, uh, you know, the, the title of my talk uh, asserts this point uh, that I firmly believe, which is that the, uh, when it comes to finding a platform for doing science on, I think the cloud is you know, hand meets glove. And the reason for this is, uh, as Aristotle bestowed to us, a little while ago, uh, slightly before I was born, um, the you know the scientific method works, right? As we know, uh, I think Richard Dawkins put it very bluntly recently that it works. Uh, did everybody see that uh, YouTube video? Did I hope so. Anyway, I won't I won't repeat his words because they're a little more blunt than mine. Anyway, um, it works, and uh, it gives you you know constantly iterating through this loop of um, making a prediction testing it against the universe, refining your model and going through. It gives you a tighter and tighter grip on reality, right? At least gives your model a tighter and tighter fit with the world. Um, and it's an iterative approach. You have modeled before hypothesis. Uh, well, actually, my... Well, you're right. Hypothesis, it, it's a circle. The point is, it's a circle. So, um, the, 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 the cloud is, is really doing this, it's embodying this in computational form. When you go out to do your, when you go out to do your uh, research, you set out on the research program, you don't know, you can't predict three years in advance what kind of computing platform you're going to need three years from now. You won't know what the memory to core ratio is, and you know, we heard a fair bit this morning about memory to core ratios. You're not going to know what memory to core ratio is actually the appropriate one for your code three years from now. You can't tell. Uh, you're not sure if GPU is going to be the right, the right tool for the job three years from now. Um, uh, you can't tell, you know, whether FPGAs might be a major breakthrough for you or not. Um, so, being able to uh, iterate and, and, you know, in a fairly agile way, choose different resources and different tools is actually crucially important. The other thing that's crucially important about this is that your science progresses around about approximately with how fast you can iterate through this loop. Um, if iterating, if, if doing the actual simulation part, which might be, in a, you know, the, might, the simulation might be, you know, map onto the experimental component here, you know, in a computational sense. If doing that part requires um, uh, putting in a merit allocation request, waiting a few months for a reply, waiting for your, waiting for a week to go by to get your job to the front of the queue, and then getting your 12 or 18 hours of execution time, um, that's actually going to be, be a pretty slow way of iterating through through this cycle. So uh, there's a few things that come out of this. Failure is a data point when something doesn't work and it doesn't match the universe. That's actually a data point actually tells you where to go. But the other thing is indeed just um, what we're aiming to do with the cloud, and this is really the large scale purpose of the cloud, both to business and to science, is that we're trying to make failure quick and cheap and easy. We're trying to get you to that point where your model breaks. Um, your model doesn't predict the world very well. You find out uh, what, what change you need to make uh, to iterate through your, through your loop again. Um, and so our, our mission really is to lower the cost of failure um, for you, who are the practitioner using this tool. So, uh, and thus we get this thing to spin around a little faster and you can iterate and get to your science a lot faster. Um, uh, there's another, uh, I, I'm shamelessly stealing this graph from my friends at Ulster's. Um, there's, another, there's another element to, to buying and building chunks of hardware, uh, which is that the, the buying takes almost as much time as the building, and then that you know, consumes an enormous amount of the life, life cycle of the machine. Um, you know, this is a fairly typical HPC acquisition plan which might take, you know, 550 days. That, that to me looks, that's pretty long. Uh, it's about a year and a half worth of expended time. Um, uh, whereas if you were to spin up something like an Ulcer's cluster out of our 
out of our app store, out of the cloud app store, you can have something running in a few minutes. And so within a few minutes, you could be actually doing your compute rather than waiting for it. Um, the Ulcers folks have done a very good job of packaging all this stuff, stuff up um, and then sticking you know, more than a thousand applications actually ready to use at the end of that food chain. So um, Naked Chain was plugged, but thank you to those guys for doing it because I think it's, uh, uh, I think this is actually, this is totally changing the equation. Um, what that actually means is that um, it gives you guys the ability to focus more on the science and not the service. We think that's, that should be your objective. Um, the service should be a thing that just get out of the way. It also means that what have you got left? What is the, what is the infrastructure of the 21st century for science? It's not boxes in racks. It's data sets, tools and techniques. Right? Um, we invest a lot of time, effort and resources in standing up large public data sets for folks to use. Um, uh, TCGA is, is a good example, a controlled access uh, public data set for you know, the Cancer Genome Atlas. Uh, a lot of genomics ones, there's a lot of satellite data ones. Uh, the reason we put these in there is because if you guys are going to go and spend I don't know, half a million dollars buying a bunch of hardware, a bunch of storage hardware so you can have a copy of a petabyte sized data set, um, well, if we, if we imagine that there's a lot of people around the world doing that, um, owning copies of the data set doesn't give you an insight. Owning a shelf full of books doesn't make you smart. Reading the books does, or potentially does. Um, processing the data potentially gives you an insight into the universe. Owning a copy of the data does not. So if we can own a copy of the data for you and access, give you access to the data for free, <coughs> and you can spend your money instead on the CPU cycles that are processing that data and getting an insight, uh, then we've changed the world. Right? And that, that to us is a much better way of doing it. So we invest a lot in putting up uh, public data sets. We also invest a lot in trying to overturn the paradigm that we're already working in ourselves. Um, uh, I think the first line of this, cannibalise your own products or somebody else will do it for you. Um, we're looking to make sure that you don't have to you know, this is one of our experiments that we're doing, is to see if we can actually get you to stop thinking about servers. Um, servers and libraries. You should be thinking about code. So, so what we've come up with is a thing that we call AWS Lambda, which is where you deploy code into the cloud, um, and you actually execute, you let us orchestrate the execution of that for you and give you the result. Um, and these can be, these can actually be uh, event-driven routines, so there's a bit of Python might be a bit of Python you deploy into the cloud and it gets picked off by an event and we have a lot of events that go on in the cloud. Events could be billing alarms, events could be a bunch of data that just arrived in a storage bucket. An event could be that a job finished running on some other, on some other platform that might be an event. And then those, those functions themselves can either be doing some compute, you know, uh, uh, processing some genomic data, doing something meaningful, or they could be orchestrating other events to, to occur. So you could actually have a dynamic HPC cluster being sprung into life in response to the arrival of some data um, that is, you know, that's, that's actually, uh, that needs processing at a large scale. And whilst that data is not there, neither is the cluster. And so uh, when you think about the economics of how to preserve your research funds, not paying for a cluster when you're not using it is a pretty good one. That's going to save you a heck of a lot of money. So, uh, which, and money, by the way, which you can spend on postdocs, PhD students, people that can do meaningful work. Um, so a good example of this, this is a really good, a good use case of, of Lambda. Um, some folks at CSIRO in Australia uh, they use Lambda to actually implement, uh, it's, a, it's a CRISPR off-target, uh, it's an off-target search workload. Now, I'm not a bioinformatician, I'm not a biologist, so, <coughs> so forgive me, I'm a recovering astronomer, uh, and I've recovered quite well, by the way. Um, but the, uh, uh, so what they did with this workload, you know, instead of actually having servers sitting around all the time waiting for a request, or instead of even having servers running uh, you know, at the scale that they need in order to get the job done in a reasonable <coughs> amount of time, and they have a two to four minute return uh, on a job as their, as their target for it to be useful in the environment they're working. Um, they implemented it as a, bunch of, as a bunch of Lambda functions in the cloud. And so when they actually need to kick off one of these things, about a billion calls get sent to Lambda of one or two functions. 
uh, results get accumulated by another function, um, and then the result gets spat back out. They, they implemented the entire workflow in a bunch of serverless functions. Um, the really cool thing about this is that when, no matter how many jobs they throw at this, we actually expand the fleet of hardware in the back. We orchestrate stuff in the back behind Lambda. Um, so whenever demand goes up, we throw more resources into Lambda. Um, that's up to us to optimize. Uh, the result that comes out of it is these guys have got a service running that gives them a, a better than two minute return time uh, and it's costing them $15 per month. $15.70, uh, they tell me. A uh, few other ways that we can change the way that computing is done. Um, notebooks, everybody knows about notebooks, of course. And in fact, I saw some people plugging away working on some data this morning in between the talks. Um, the ability to take something in a, in a notebook format from your laptop and push it up into a server, push it up into the cloud, you can push it onto some GPUs, you can push your data onto a cluster in the cloud, and all of that stuff can be done dynamically. You can, you can try before you buy. You can figure out if the, cluster, if the cloud's going to work for you um, by spinning up a small cluster and seeing if your code will scale and give you, the, give you the, uh, uh, the results that you're expecting or at least give you the performance results you're expecting. So we do all of this by having a very large global infrastructure. Uh, we've, uh, we just announced last week that we're, uh, or the week before, sorry, that we're opening up a new region in Stockholm. Um, uh, later this year, we'll open up one of the regions we're constructing in Paris. Uh, we've already got them in London, Dublin, and Frankfurt. Um, and then we're expanding uh, elsewhere around the world as well. We've got some more announcements coming in in the coming months. Um, this is a very large infrastructure. Uh, in most, the, the, and the way that we arrange our infrastructure, we group data centers together in things called regions. So, a region for us is a collection of availability zones. These are things that are fault tolerant to each other, or at least have different fault tolerance characteristics. Um, that allows our customers to be able to build uh, build different services that they might want to construct, like say DNA Nexus have opened up a, uh, uh, they've opened up a, a workload in our Frankfurt region. Uh, when you push something to DNA Nexus, they actually straddle across multiple av av availability zones so that they can be sure to have something that's always up when you're expecting it to always be up. Um, and then inside those AZs, inside those availability zones, are data centers themselves. And then inside those data centers are usually tens of thousands of servers. And so these are extraordinarily large pieces of infrastructure. Uh, James Hamilton, our chief engineer, blogged the other day that a, a typical infrastructure investment for us in the region is in the, in the neighborhood of a couple of hundred million dollars, this base case. So, um, so you get the idea, this is, a, this is a very large piece of infrastructure. Um, we, we do something rather unusual, which is that we make all of our spare CPU cycles that we have available in all of these regions available in an auction market. And for scientists, that's actually a pretty attractive thing. Um, the, the auction market is attractive because you can name your own price. Uh, so it's kind of like an eBay for CPU cores. Um, so this will get you this will get you a vast amount of resources in the order of say you know around about a cent per core hour um, is a fairly normal normal price to be paid in there. Um, what's interesting is that you can you can drive some extremely large workloads. Uh, so these are the guys at Fermilab. Uh, one of my favourite examples. They used just just shy of sixty thousand cores over a weekend to process a, a large backlog of data. Um, you know, this is the you know this is this is our spare infrastructure in one of our regions in the U.S. So often our spare capacity is larger than most people's actual capacity. Uh, Sixty thousand cores would pretty much uh, how many how many cores at Archer how many cores has Archer got? One hundred twenty thousand. So we're not doing too bad, right? It's a fairly large and respectable amount of spare capacity. So. Um, anyway, we break all of that up into a large number of different instance types and different services. So um, this, is a, this is an eye chart. Um, uh, we could do a test, we could do a pop quiz on this later if anybody wants to try and memorise it. But you know, there's, thing, there's, there's basic things in there like server storage and networking that you can bolt together into solutions yourself. Or you can take some solutions just off the shelf that are pre-canned, like a database. Um, I want a SQL database now. You, you get a SQL database and you can start doing SQL. I want an HPC cluster now. Um, uh, I would like a MapReduce cluster now. And the really cool things about this is this gives you the ability to actually experiment. 
again, this gets back to the cloud as being a computational environment for experimentation. You can wake up in the morning and, and actually theorize that your workload is going to be assisted by maybe a MapReduce approach, and you can give it a try. You can spin something up by lunchtime, give it a whirl. Uh, by the end of the day, you can be convinced one way or the other that this is either going or not going to work. Um, and gives you the ability to do that experimentation. Uh, our compute platform, it's a bit of an eye chart. You can't read this. Um, I, actually, I really do challenge anybody to read this. And it's not the full list anymore. Uh, we've had some new instances come out, uh, and we've got some more coming soon, so it'll, it'll become even more unreadable. But it gives you the idea that no matter what kind of compute problem that you have, you will find a platform in there that you can experiment on. Large memory, small memory, high I.O., low I.O., uh, sequential I.O., uh, random I.O., um, uh, GPUs, FPGAs, um, all of these kinds of things. So we're experimenting with all of these things ourselves because uh, we're trying to work out how to solve some of our own problems. With more than a million customers around the world, Everybody's got a different workload. Uh, it's it's a, it's important for us to have a large amount of uh, speciation, I guess, in this space. Um, we do everything through user interface, of course. There's a nice, pretty web interface for doing this stuff. It's actually pretty easy to create servers and create clusters through a web interface. But we also believe in doing, making all of that available as code as well, whether that be uh, an API endpoint, so everything that you can do through the user interface you can do with an API or a command line, and in fact quite often you can do more um, than you can do through the, through the user interface. Um, the reason for doing that is that code is more reliable than people, um, and the other good thing about it is when you solve a problem once, it stays solved. So you write a script that spins up a cluster uh, that has a particular uh, branch and variety of software and resources on it, um, and you can come back to that any time you like, a year, two years later. Um, you can just come and spin that stuff back up. Seven years later, you can come and spin that same stuff back up. Um, it means that, it also means that you don't make mistakes. If you're, if you're spinning up a cluster to do some work this week, turn it back off, uh, and then come back a semester later, you're not going to make any mistakes in reproducing that environment. You can just pull it out of, out of, uh, out of the freezer uh, and it's ready to go again. Uh, it also means you don't make it when you win. Not making mistakes is also very important for security. Uh, I heard security come, come up a few times this morning. Security is critical, right? So security is our number one priority. Um, at, a, at a global level, we can't afford to be lax with security. Uh, it's, 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 so that would be an impossible outcome for us. Um, it, you know, we have, we have to be more paranoid than our most paranoid customers. Uh, we have banks. You know, I have a, my bank back in Australia actually performs most of their transactions and most of their work in the cloud. In a highly regulated uh, banking sector like that, the ability to actually put banking applications in the cloud means that our security has to be super tight. Um, and our ability to comply with those requirements has to be super tight. We carry clinical data, we carry patient identifiable data in the cloud. The way that we do that is we have we have things uh, well we have these things called quick starts. Right? Quick starts are a really neat way to get environments set up automatically. Um, so, for instance, if you're working with data that has to be classified as UK official, it has to be treated in a UK official manner. Um, you can spin up a UK official environment in the cloud that gives you all of the controls, all of the um, access functions, audit methods. Uh, and uh, compliance strictures uh, that you might need in order to hit that standard. Uh, and we have a, you know, we have a yet another eye chart that's got all of the logos for all of these different types of standards we have to meet in different environments around the world. Um, cost and con cost control and budgeting is something that always comes up. Um, uh, everybody's wondering, well, this stuff costs money. How do I make sure I don't spend too much money? Uh, that's actually a very good question. We're actually more enthusiastic about trying to fit, figure out ways of saving you money than we are in trying to drain your wallet. Um, uh, it would be a happy thing for me if everybody stopped buying too much physical infrastructure and used the cloud. It would be an even happier thing if everybody net net spent less on infrastructure and more on science. Right? That to me is a, a much more noble objective. So um, we have a lot of tools that are built into our into our interface to help you control your costs. Um, we have some new we have some new tools that we've that we've implemented that allow you to limit your spend. 
Um, and so I will shamelessly promote this book, um, written by a very good-looking author. Um, anyway, this book has got most of the tools that you are likely to need, or at least it's, it's a really good start for getting, getting work, uh, research work done in the cloud. Um, what's most interesting about it, the tools in here will actually show you how to put a lid on your spend. So if you've decided in advance that your, uh, that your spending cap is going to be $100 a month, you can put in a $100 a month cap in there. You'll get notified as you progress towards that number. Um, and, at, and when you actually get to that number, it will trigger a function which will shut everything down. And if that's, if that's a good outcome, or if that actually means that you've got that financial firewall in there so that you know you're not going to trip over a budget limit, um, and that, gives you a, that, that should give you a much more comfortable and safe space in order to play. The book also takes you through some, some steps to make sure that your data is secure as well and that your account is set up in a, you know, in a properly secure way. Um, so there's a lot of that inside the book. There's also a lot of other stuff inside the book that will actually help you understand what solutions are available once you're in the cloud. Uh, everything from clustered file systems to uh, uh, ulcers like HPC clusters, uh, DNA Nexus, software as a service portals, uh, any number of different things. Right. So um, anyway, so I'll, I'll sort of leave it there. Um, if anybody wants a copy of the book, there's a URL there. Uh, you can go and register, download a copy online, uh, and get cracking. Uh, 152 pages of goodness. Anyway, uh, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Take a breath and take questions.